Good evening. Welcome to Maysville this evening. If you are visiting with us, we're delighted to have you with us. And if you wouldn't mind, if you are visiting and filling out one of the uh, blue cards on the pew backs in front of you, uh, we'd like to have a record of your attendance with us and uh, make you feel welcome here and invite you back to be with us again soon. Uh, opening song this evening will be number 825. 825. We'll have our uh, closing prayer at the uh, conclusion by Brother Bruce Jacobs and our opening prayer by Brother Rick Presnell. The uh, last of leaders we met this morning after uh, services, and there is also some information on the table in the foyer. If you need a, a recap on what's going on, uh, pick up one of the information. Uh, there's two pages that are together and also a list of cell phone numbers. So please get the uh, contact numbers. You might need that while we're away. And uh, that information is right back in the foyer on the table. Also, don't forget the uh, eighth grade puppet team. You will have practice immediately following church this evening. Uh, so please make plans to, to be there. Also, the uh, 11th and 12th grade puppet team, you will practice tonight after services, and uh, you'll grab a bite to eat for dinner immediately following worship and back to the building here for practice. And again, that was the 11th and 12th grade puppet team. Also, if you have any information for the uh, youth news, please give that to uh, Seth or Jill Bowen uh, as soon as you can. Uh, Wednesday is the, the deadline to get the information in for that. So if you have that, please see them as soon as possible. Also, we mentioned this morning, um, if you were a young couple or know of a young couple who was married this past year in 2011, uh, we'd like to have that uh, one picture of that couple for our, uh, our scrapbook this year. And you can see Yvonne Hand for that. And you need to see her immediately, if not sooner, so we can uh, have that information for the scrapbook there, please. Also, don't forget uh, a gospel meeting coming up in May, uh, May 6th to the 9th, our speaker, Brother Jim Dearman, and uh, make plans to be a part of that as well. Again, May 6th through the 9th. Also, if you're graduating from high school or college, we mentioned this morning uh, to please get your information and uh, 10 to 12 photos into Betty Hall as soon as you can. And um, we need to make preparations to get, to get that pre prepared for the event that's coming up May 20th. Uh, so the sooner you can get at, that in, the better. I believe that's all the announcements I have uh, this evening. I did uh, speak with Jill Robinson coming in. David's not feeling well this evening, and he's at home, so please keep David and uh, the rest of their family in your prayers right now. Again, opening song number 825. Uh, let's begin our worship by Scripture. Brother Seth Bowen will have our reading. Let's all get our Bibles and read from God's Word together. If you have our Bibles and you'd like to follow along, we'll be reading Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moons and the stars, which you have set into place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the work of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Father, we are so grateful to you for allowing us to be with our family this evening, the family that's made possible through your blessings. Father, we thank you for the greatest blessing of all, the blessing of your son, the sacrifice that you made, allowing him to come to live the life that we need, an example, we need to follow. Father, we are thankful for that sacrifice upon the cross also. Father, we thank you for this congregation, this family that meets here, for what it means to each of us personally and for what it means to the community. Father, may we reach out to each other 
and reach out to the community also with that same love. Father, thank you for this opportunity that we have to come before you in prayer. Father, there are many of this congregation that have very many needs. Father, we know of those that are undergoing medical procedures, surgeries are coming up, treatments. We ask that you may use us to reach out to them, show their love for them. Father, we thank you also for the leadership that we have here at Maysville, for the fact that they are bold enough to be leaders, bold enough to take us forward instead of just trying to be content with the status quo. Father, we thank you for this country that we live in. Father, we're going to be in an election this year. There's an awful lot of talk going on both sides. Father, may we prayerfully consider those running. Father, may we also elect those that will allow us to have peace. Father, once again, we thank you for your love, your blessings, and the oversight that uh, we have here. Keep us in your blessings always. First in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Eight hundred twenty-five. Well, let's do the first and second stanzas, please. <clears throat> Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me. I know. First and second stanzas, please. <clears throat> I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply sank within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lives in me.
610, number 610. When my way grows Six, seven hundred ninety six. <clears throat> do the first and the second, please. <clears throat> oh, Christian, do not hide your light for ye are the light of the world. But keep it trimmed and burning bright for ye are the light of the world. For Oh, yeah. 
271. 271. Do the first and the last of this one, please. <clears throat> I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down the weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus. and we'll sing that after the lesson this evening. And now number 315, number 315. <clears throat> and we'll do the first and the second of this one, please. If you'd like to, please stand and join with me in singing 315. <clears throat> I'd like to stay longer than hands of life. Welcome to you tonight. As already has been stated, we're glad that you're here. If you're a visitor, we want you to feel like you're an honored guest. If you are a visitor, you'll notice we have some empty seats. We have an, an incredible number of our young people involved in a leadership training program, and some of the young men are out tonight uh, doing a practice delivery of lessons that they are presenting. Uh, they're all going to culminate next weekend at a convention in Nashville. We have students involved in speaking both boys and girls, song leading, scripture reading, 
uh, puppet theater, scrapbooking debate. I still think it's bad if we teach teenage girls how to argue, but hey, <laughs> at least maybe they'll use it appropriately at some point. But that's where a lot of our folks are. Our regular pulpit minister, Tim Orbison, and his wife are on a little vacation trip. Tim's been wanting to f- go to a fly-in that takes place down in Florida, and because it's spring break, Miss Libby was able to go, and they flew down, and, and I guess they're going to watch airplanes fly or maybe even get to fly in the airplanes. I'm not really sure how fly-ins work, but they're staying in a tent. So y'all pray for Miss Libby. I'm not sure that's her thing, but uh, she wanted to go and, and uh, be with Tim, and I think it'll be a, a good uh, a deal. My uncle, when I was a little boy, built experimental aircraft. He built the very first Breezy in Alabama. If you've seen a plane that looks like a rail buggy with no sides, tops, or doors, just seats, propeller, and a seat belt, he built the first one in Alabama and built the second Very Ease. And a Very Ease is a plane with a long wing in the back rather than the front. It's a cool-looking little spaceship thing. So I spent a lot of time in planes as a kiddo getting to fly around with my uncle. They flew the Breezy to a fly-in in Oshkosh, Wisconsin and got caught in a thunderstorm and had to land in a guy's cow pasture. It was quite the adventure for a little guy of about 12 or 13 to hear his aunt and uncle doing all this cool stuff in planes. But I decided that if I flew a plane, I would let the professionals fly me. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's where they are and what they're doing. Uh, David Robinson went with us to Kill Mountain today, and I, he may have overextended himself, Jill, I'm not sure. Uh, David's a captain in the fire department here. And when he knew that Troy and I were going to go do a little work uh, with the Kill Mountain Volunteer Fire Department on their vertical stuff, and we weren't really doing any rescue-type stuff as much as teaching them, if you have a guy go off one of those bluffs on Kill Mountain and you need to get a rescuer to them, you know, what's the quickest, most efficient way to get it? The, The station that David had worked at for years is kind of the rope station in Huntsville. They do the confined space rescue. One of their guys tours the country teaching this kind of stuff. And so David went and offered uh, training and services and, and kind of a, an interaction between the two departments. And I don't know what you know about firemen, but there's real firemen and there's volunteer firemen. And sometimes there's this rah, rah, rah that takes place between them. And David recognized the very valuable assistance that our volunteer firemen both in our area and on Keel Mountain provide for the community and offered or extended to them a professional right hand of fellowship and I thought it was pretty cool that uh, as bad as he feels to take time out of a weekend and go over there and be with us. And so uh, we worked with the guys probably the fifth year in a row that gone up there and trained with those guys and taught them some knots. And then we re- rappel off a little bluff on, on Phil Butler's place. And we found no copperheads and nobody fell off that wasn't supposed to go over the edge. So it was a pretty good afternoon. And uh, I even got to go home and change clothes. So it was cool. Uh, if you have your Bibles, look at Colossians 3. Spend maybe just a little time Looking at some concepts there. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died... And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to the earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry, and because of these things the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but you must rid yourselves of all such things as these anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language from your lips. And do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Here, there is no Greek, there is no Jew, there is no circumcised or uncircumcised barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. As Paul writes to the church at Colossae, he's reminding them of some things. This is, this is not one of those chapters that you look at easily. This is not a first principle chapter. 
This is not Paul writing to people who are non-Christians and trying to get them to become Christians. This is not an elementary discussion of uh, turning from your old way. He's talking to folks who are Christians. And he's trying to get them to refocus on some things. They've, they've got, probably in the city of Colossae, you, the reason this letter is being written is Epaphras, who probably helped start the church there, has gone to Rome to visit Paul and is telling him there's some things going on in Colossae. There's people teaching this ceremonialism and there's people teaching about Jewish asceticism and there's probably some worship of angels going on and and there may even be some early, early forms of Gnosticism and they're tearing up the church with the kind of things you have to do. You've got to obey this ceremony. You've got to follow this ritual. And you've got to do these things. And then you've got the ascetics whose motto was do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. And Paul will say a rule like that has no value against dealing with the flesh because they're not connected to the head that is Christ. And so Paul writes and he simply is giving them a refocus. And the refocus is this. You were raised. Now, we read that, and we, yeah, yeah. You can't be raised unless you were buried. And you shouldn't be buried unless you were dead. And what he's talking about is when, when you were baptized, when you were put under that water, a part of you died, or a part of you was supposed to die. I'm guilty of having been swept up into the zombie apocalypse thing that's going on in the nation. I like zombie movies. I like zombie episodes. You know, Cody Gothart probably drug me down the path the first time when he was in the seventh grade and gave me the uh, the zombie handbook. It's a great little read if you haven't read it. It's really cool. Uh, I'm a member on Facebook of the Biological Outbreak Squad. I think there's four of us, but it's me and Cody and a guy at uh, UAH. And so I know what to do if the zombies come. The problem with zombies is they're supposed to be dead, and they're not. So they're just walking around. If you're a Christian and you haven't put to death certain things, you're a zombie. You're a spiritual zombie. You've got things in your life that ought to be done, buried, left in the water, have nothing to do with, and yet they're out walking around. And Paul says the idea is if you've been raised, you've got to remember what you were raised from. You were buried in water and baptism, and when you contacted the blood of Christ, you were done with the sin business. But if you've been raised and your mind is on earthly things and you're pursuing the earthly pursuits and you're looking after this agenda and you haven't gotten rid of the sexual immorality and you haven't gotten rid of these impurity, then you've got some things walking around that are supposed to be buried. And those things that are walking around that are supposed to be buried are infecting everybody that they touch. And we can't have this in the body of Christ. Because once that happens, it begins to corrupt everybody. So as he continues with this idea of what you've got to bury, he says that you used to walk in these ways, but now you should should be different. And you should rid yourself. This is verse 8 of anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language and don't lie to each other. He says, you have taken off your old self. And literally this Greek word is the idea of taking off a dirty pair of clothes and putting on a clean pair of clothes. It's almost like when an animal or an insect goes through metamorphosis. It sheds one body and puts on a new body. He said, you were buried with Christ. When you rise, you set your mind on things above. When you died, you died. You kill these things in your nature. You kill these things in your life. And he talks about the things that are personal. And then he talks about the things that are interpersonal. In other words, the bad things we say about people. Getting our feelings hurt and, and, and talking about folks rather than to folks. He basically, you know, if you look at, at, at cyberbullying or Facebook drama. He's talking about the kind of things that happen when people don't control what they say to each other and about each other. And so not only if I'm raised with Christ do I get my life in order and get rid of the impurity and the sexual immorality and the covetousness which equals idolatry. In other words, if you're worshiping money and stuff more than God, it's the same as worshiping an idol. Not only do I get rid of those things, but I also have to get rid of the ways that I treat people that are unhealthy. 
I have to change the way that I interact with folks, and I can't have anger, at least not inappropriate anger. And, and I really think it's, it's the idea that the anger that leads to rage. If you have anger that doesn't lead to rage, then it's that anger where God says you can be angry and sin not. The interesting thing about some of these emotions, and I've probably done this before, but your emotions function as a thermometer, not as a GPS. A GPS tells you which way to go, and a thermometer just gives you information about what's happening in the system. So when I experience any emotion, and our emotions are God-given, when you get an emotion, you should just register that in your system. Hey, this is going on. In fact, if you look at the marriage work that John Gottman does, he says that if you can self-monitor your physiological reactions, and you recognize that when your heart is beating faster, and when you're breathing more shallow, when you become self-aware of what's happening with your emotions, by the way, when you reach that heightened state, when you start breathing fast and your heart's beating fast, you feel threatened. But when you feel threatened, your peripheral systems begin to shut down. Uh, that's why the guys who teach combat talk about things that uh, you don't use fine motor skills for. Because when you start talking about combat, you're using gross motor skills because you can't function on the fine motor level when you're in that threatened ability. When you feel threatened in a conversation with your spouse or you feel threatened in a conversation with your parents and your heart rate increases and your breathing increases, you're in threatened mode. And when you're in threatened mode, your ability, number one, to listen goes out the window. And number two, your ability to process information goes out the window. All you tend to do is, is defend. When Gottman does therapy, he puts a respirator and a blood ox monitor on folks. So he can say, you recognize that while you're talking to your husband about missing supper last night, your heart's beating 200 beats a minute. And she'll sit there just as calm with little hands folded in her lap and go, I didn't like it that he didn't come to supper. But inside, she's, she's a thunderstorm. And Paul says, you've got to change the way you interact with people and be aware that your emotions don't tell you what direction to go. Your emotions give you information. Hey, something's happening with my system, and if I let it keep going, I'm going to be unable to interact in an appropriate way, and you self-monitor. Your emotions are simply information about the system. They're not a GPS. But so many times when our emotions say anger, we turn left or right on Anger Street. And if our emotions say that I'm depressed and we turn left or right down depression street and rather than just using our emotions as information we use our emotions as direction and paul says christians people who've been raised with christ aren't driven by their emotions they control their emotions or at least use their emotions appropriately and then he says and you take off this old stuff and and literally verse 9 do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and you've put on the new self now, when you put on the new self, you do some recognition of other people. He says, when you put on your new self and you become a member of Christ, in Christ, and he lists that there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's not circumcision, there's not uncircumcision, there's not barbarian, and there's not Scythian, there's not slave or free. Those are real interesting concepts. First of all, the Jewish people had a real understanding of who was Jewish and who was not. And they drew some pretty harsh lines between who was Jewish and who was not. In the story of the Good Samaritan, when the guy asked Jesus, who is my neighbor, he expected Jesus to say, your neighbor's anybody who's a Jew. And what Jesus said was, your neighbor's anybody that you cross that has trouble. In fact, if you'll notice in, 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 in Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan, he gives you three major players, priest, Levite, Samaritan. And then he says, now here's the test at the end of the test. Who was the neighbor to the guy that fell among thieves? All right, so if I've given you that question, you have three possible answers. Priest, Levite, Samaritan. How does the Jewish lawyer answer him? The one who showed him mercy. Hey, folks, that Jewish guy not even going to say the word Samaritan, <laughs> much less admit that he's the guy who's the neighbor. That's how prejudiced they were against the non-Jews, or especially against the impure Jews because Samaritans are kind of part Jew and not part Jew. And so in that context, when he says, when you become a Christian, when you're raised, when you set your mind on heavenly things, when you start 
living a different way. First of all, you clean your act up. No sexual immorality, no impurity, no greediness, no covetousness. And then you quit this wrath and this anger and this filthy language and this blasphemy. And all those words there deal with how I treat people and how I treat people with my mouth and my attitude. He says, once you take that off and put this on, you've changed your perspective of people. And you don't categorize people, number one, as either Jew or, or non-Jew. Secondly, you don't look at whether or not they're circumcised or uncircumcised. That, that was part of that Jewish heresy that said, if you don't follow the strict Jewish laws, you're not a real Christian. Well, there are some things that, that we do differently because of our culture that we make issues of fellowship. And it's just not. I have been in some subcultures at some churches where if you didn't wear the right thing or you wore the wrong thing, you were in trouble. I got to go down to uh, Winter Haven, Florida. The guy who made the invitation for me to go to Winter Haven, Florida was an African-American gentleman. He was at uh, an elders conference at Faulkner that I spoke at, and they invited me to come down. I didn't have any idea it was an all-African-American church. Well, now, I hate, number one, to fly. Number two, I hate to, to check baggage. So I put my clothes in a single bag, a uh, just a little army backpack that I've got that I go on the plane and don't check luggage. So to to do this seminar, I took a pair of khaki pants and a button-down shirt and a couple of ties. Have you ever been to church with the African-American brethren? Hey, the dude there preaching for them, his his suit cost more than my car, I'll guarantee you. It's unbelievable. He had a three-quarter length black suit with a kind of a purplish vest inside and had his name embroidered on the cuffs of his pants and his shirt. And I walk in there rocking my khaki pants and a button-down shirt. But you know what? They understood that I didn't know what was going on. They fellowshiped me. But if I go back down there, I bet I'll take a suit or two. I'll tell you, Jack said, I can't believe you went down there without a suit. And I tried not to tell her, but it came out. There are places, though, where if you don't have the right thing on, they're not going to have anything to do with you. These Jewish ascetics had the idea that if you don't obey these, these, these strict external things, you're not worthy. And Paul said, look, when you start getting along in Christ, you don't have this list of external things where you measure people. You're not going to decide whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. Then either it doesn't matter if you're a barbarian. Now, barbarian was anybody who couldn't speak Greek. Most of this world had been Hellenized due to some of the stuff that Alexander the Great had propagated. And so most of the civilized world could speak some kind of Greek. The New Testament is written in Koine Greek, which is a real kind of relaxed, uh, easy Greek. But he, but he says it doesn't matter if people are, are civilized. And what he meant by that was, you know, th these folks would have been uncouth. You wouldn't have been comfortable with them at your dinner table because they couldn't speak Greek. And then he adds a level to it, not only barbarian, but Scythian. And folks, the Scythians in the first century were basically seen as a little step above a wild animal. They would have made the barbarians uncomfortable. This is a people that originally came out of Russia. And so you take your old, old, old images of the evil bad guy Russians from the Cold War, and then you turn them into cavemen, and you've got a Scythian. And you had Scythians who went to church with these people in Corinth. And you talk about being uncomfortable when they greeted you in the foyer. Wow. Okay. Come here, oh, my brother. You know, pick you up and sling you around. Because you had these Russian barbarian, basically animals. And Paul said, look, you don't look at these people, whether they're Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. And we can't get our mind around coming to church with somebody that somebody else in the building owns. Or coming into church and worshiping with your owner. As a culture, we just don't get that. But in the New Testament church, you had an owner and property. And when they walked into the body of Christ, they were brothers. Folks, there is no status in the church. Brother is not a title. It's an adjective. Now, I'm honored when I go places and they introduce me as Brother Lonnie or Brother Jones. And, and we use that as, as kind of a title. It's not a title. It's an adjective. 
It means it doesn't matter how much money you're worth. It doesn't matter how educated you are. It doesn't matter how sophisticated you are. It doesn't matter how unsophisticated you are. It doesn't matter if you're owner or property. When we enter the body of Christ, we are brothers. And Paul said you've got to treat people this way. And then he begins to explain how you treat people. Therefore, verse 12, as God's chosen people, now here's what gives you value, not the fact that you're a Greek or a Jew or a barbarian or a Scythian or a slave or a free, but the thing that gives us value is that God chose us. And God chose us holy and dearly loved. When you see somebody, rather than evaluate them from our standpoint, we've got to evaluate them from God's standpoint. And if this is a person that God chose... They're dearly loved. And if it's a person that hasn't yet been chosen as a son of God, it's our job to tell them that God's looking for more children. And we need to invite them to be part of the family. So when we begin to interact with people, it's the idea that is, as God's chosen people and we're holy and dearly loved, we either need to see each other that God says you're holy and dearly loved. You're holy and dearly loved. And if God treats you as holy and dearly loved, I've got to treat you as holy and dearly loved. And if I don't get that, I don't get anything about Christianity. Because Christianity hinges on how we treat each other. So... Brethren, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion and kindness and humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And above all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now you just look at that list of what he says to put on. And although it's not an exact one-to-one transfer, this is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Paul says you cannot be a mature Christian without the manifestation of Christian maturity in your life. And either you're a zombie, you've got things in your life that should be dead that are walking around not, or you're just going through the motions and you don't really have an interaction with people, and that makes you a puppet. So you're either a zombie or a puppet. But if you get it, and you get it right, and you change the way you treat people, and you deal with the compassion and the kindness and the humility and the gentleness, and and notice what he says about forgiveness. If you've got a grievance against somebody, forgive them. Just as Christ forgave you. Now, I've heard it discussed ad infinitum ad nauseum that you don't have to forgive somebody unless they ask you for forgiveness. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. The people murdering and yelling for the death of Jesus did not have a repentant bone in their body. And Jesus said, God, they're acting out of ignorance. I forgive them, you forgive them. And if you've got unfinished business with somebody, you don't have to wait for them to come to their senses. You forgive them as Christ forgave you. Write it off, cut it loose, let it go. Forgiveness between two people has very little to do with the other person and has everything to do with you. And when I decide that I'm not going to be a zombie and I'm not going to be a puppet, I'm going to start treating people that if I've got unfinished business with, I just write that business off and let it go. And they don't have to be asking me to do it. I get to do it because I'm taking off an old way of acting and putting on a new way of acting. And that's what Christian forgiveness is about. He said, and then when you do all these things, you, you, you wrap them up and you bind them with love. I don't know if your house is like our house and you got computers with wires that go everywhere and you get those little uh, zip ties that you bind your wires together and take care of stuff love's the zip tie that holds all this stuff together and love is basically not an emotion it's an attitude and the Christian idea of love is the Greek word agapao or agape and it's an attitude that says I'm going to do what's best for you 
I'm going to look out for your needs rather than my rights. And Paul says, if you can tie all this stuff together with the thing that binds them all together, you'll get what it is to be a new person. You'll get what it is to be resurrected. You'll get what it is to be a new creature and view people differently. But I'm not waiting on you to ask me for forgiveness. I'm just giving it. And then he goes on to say some real interesting stuff about how our lives should be centered Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs of gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. When Paul wraps this part of his discussion up, he basically says that we've got to be people who are controlled and ruled by peace. The, the Hebrew greeting, shalom, is, is their greeting of peace. And the concept of peace is way different for them than it was for us. When a person had shalom in their life, they were at peace with God. They're at peace with their circumstances. They were at peace with their work. They're at peace with their finances. They were. It was. It was almost a almost a Zen concept of, of of being one or being at ease. He says people who are Christians should not be unsettled people. That doesn't mean we can't get bad news. That doesn't mean we can't be upset. That doesn't mean we can't be disappointed. But what it means is the, the primary function of our life is that we are well when we sing the song, It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, I can say it is well with my soul. The idea of letting the Christian be a person of peace is that we are at peace with God, we are at peace with one another, and we are at peace with our circumstances because the external things of our lives don't control us. It's an internal thing that controls our life. The idea behind shalom or peace is real close, if not an exact transfer with what Jesus does in the Beatitudes when he talks about blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. The word there he uses for blessed was kind of a play on words with what the Greeks thought about as the state of the gods, that the gods lived in a state that had nothing to do with circumstances. And they were in this blessed state. That's Christianity. That we're raised, and because we're raised, we're, we're not of the physical anymore. We're not of the flesh anymore. And so our mindset is different, and because our mindset is different, we can be at peace, at peace with God, at peace with each other, and at peace with our circumstances. And then he simply says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom. And I sometimes get in trouble for this, and I don't, I don't mean this to be controversial. But this is one of those go-to verses that we use to teach about instrumental music. Well, the same verse that we use as a proof text that says, you've got to sing and sing only, says you've got to have the Word of Christ dwelling in you with wisdom. And if you don't read your Bible and you don't understand your Bible, you're violating a command just as much as if you brought a piano in here and we tried to worship with it. In fact, you're probably at more spiritual danger of not being able to find out for yourself what God's Word says to you than anything else. Because if your relationship with God is an indirect relation and you've got to have me or Tim or Carrie or Mac or Jim or Emmett tell you what the Bible says to you, and you're not a self-reliant Christian, you can't feed yourself. And the idea that, that, that we really know what, what it says about music but what does it say about the Word of Christ dwelling in us richly with all wisdom? If you don't have a personal relationship with this book and you can't figure out what it says for your life, you probably don't have much of a relationship with God anyway because you don't get your information about how to please God through an indirect source. You get your information about how to please God from what God's Word says to you. We mentioned this Koine Greek earlier. Koine Greek, if you translate it, it's probably translated on about a third grade reading level. And and again, I, I may get in trouble for this. If you've got a translation of the Bible that you can't comprehend, 
get a translation of the Bible that you can comprehend. Now, there's no perfect translation out there, and, and there's d literal translations, and there's dynamic equivalents. But, folks, there's enough Greek tools on the Internet that you can take a Bible that you can read and comprehend, and if you think it says something that, that's wrong, you can do as much Greek work as I can in about 30 minutes. If you've got an iPad, you can download a Greek app and go, hey, what does that word mean? And, and you've got it. If you read the old King James Version of the Bible, you've got to have a 12th grade reading level to understand it. If you're using a New International Version, you need a ninth grade reading level to understand it. If you've got a Bible that you can't pick up and read and understand what it says, I recommend that you get something that you can read or the Word of Christ cannot dwell in you richly with all wisdom. And you read a translation and you're not sure. I'm not sure. You do three things. Number one, you look at the context. Who was speaking? When was it speaking? And does it make sense in the context? Number two, you look for a clear text. I got asked uh, in Bible class Wednesday night, what happens after you die? Not real sure. Depends on if you take the rich man and Lazarus as a literal discussion or if you look at the things that Solomon said when he says the dead do not know anything about the living. We read the verse in Hebrews 9, 27 today, which said, It is appointed unto man to die and then the judgment. That I can prove. You're going to live, you're going to die, and you're going to be in judgment. Now, what's the time scale between death and judgment? I don't know. But all of us are going to end up in judgment. So you take a context, you take a clear text, and if you can't solve the problem from that, then you look in the original text. And like I said, the stuff that we learned in, in elementary Greek and the two years of Greek that I took in college, you can do that in your home, on your iPad, or on your computer in about 30 minutes which used to take us all... When I discovered a parsing guide, a parsing guide is a word, is a book. You find a Greek word, and you open it up, and it says this is a second voice middle participle of this Greek root word. I'd have loved to have that in Jack McKinney's class because you had to really, really struggle to find... And I discovered that. I said, Dr. McKinney, did you know they make this? He said, that's not allowed in my class, Mr. Jones. I said, why not? He said, well, the theory is if you end up on a desert island somewhere without the, the gospel and you just have the Greek text, you'll be able to translate it for the people there. I said, I'll take my chances, Dr. McKinney. I'm keeping my parsing guide. That's why I made a B in Greek and not an A. All right? But you've got those tools at your fingertips as a free app on the Internet. If you don't understand the Bible, it's your fault. And God says, if you're going to have this relationship as a raised person, you let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom. And then when you do that, your attitude of worship and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs can be way different because you understand what you're doing. You understand what you're about. And then he wraps up this chapter talking about some very specific relationship problems. He talks about wives. He talks about husbands. He talks about children. He talks about fathers. He talks about slaves. And he talks about masters. Now, folks, is there any other relationship? You, know, you talked about family. You talk about submissive relationships. You talk about the person that is at work. And you talk about the person who's the boss at work. And I, I don't know that there's very many other dynamics you can cover in that. But listen to what he says about the new people and how we behave in our relationships. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. That basically says there's a role to play in a marriage. That God has designed a hierarchy. And, and the word submission is not a bad word. It, it deals a lot with respect. It's been my observation through the years as a counselor that one of the reasons God asked women to submit to husbands is because husbands work better when we are respected. You want to get a man to be cantankerous, you disrespect him in any way, shape, or form. And when wives treat their husbands with a certain amount of decorum and a certain amount of respect, it speaks to the man on a level that I don't know that women understand. But God was smart enough in His wisdom to say, if we arrange this dynamic in, in relationships where men aren't respected, it's not going to work well in the relationship between husbands and wives. So wives... If you're going to be raised, if you're going to put on this new person, you've got to decide to, to interact with your husbands with a certain amount of respect. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. God understands how women are wired. 
Men can say things to men that we just don't worry about. But women need a certain amount of affection. Women need a certain amount of tenderness. Women need a certain amount of interaction. You, you look at when women do things together, it's constant interaction. And Jackie has the volleyball team over to eat supper at our house. You have 14 girls and 17 conversations going on at the same time. They'll be on the phone with somebody, text somebody, talk to somebody, and this kid will answer this kid. And it, it, it's like having, it, it's like a bucket of frogs in your house. It's unbelievable what 14-year-old girls can talk about for hours, and it would be nonsensical. I go fishing with Jim Goins, and we sit in a boat for four hours. Jim's not going to look at me and go, are we okay? Because if he does, one of us is getting out of the boat. <laughs> Men don't have to interact that way. But women, husbands, love your wives, and don't be harsh with them. Understand that the females need a certain amount of affection. Where men run on respect, women run on affection. Children, obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. And as unpopular as it is, you're not in charge of your household. If you're dependent on your parents for anything... You are dependent on them for what they tell you you can do and what they tell you you can't do. And if you will obey your parents, that pleases the Lord. Reference back to the story of Jesus in the temple. His parents find him in the temple, and they're shocked that he's there. He's been missing somewhere between three and five days. And his mother says, why you you worried us to death? He says, didn't you know I should be about my father's business? Well, Jesus' response is, you brought me down here to Jerusalem and I went through this ceremony where I said, I'm a man, I'm responsible for the covenant, and now since you're a man, what's going to be your job? I will be about my father's business. It was a ceremony. But when Jesus said, I'll be about my father's business, he was serious. So when they left, he stayed. He's, I'm going to work. When they found him, you're not supposed to be at work yet. You're a kid, you're 12. And the Bible says that they did not understand these things. Now, who had the perfect knowledge here, Jesus or his parents? Well, it's uncomfortable, but the 12-year-old kid was right. Joseph's not my real father. I came from God, and my father's business is the temple, and I'm here. I'm asking questions. I'm answering questions. I'm listening. They snatched him up and took him to Nazareth. And the Bible says in Luke 2.53 that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Verse 51 says that he went down to Nazareth and was subject unto them. That means he obeyed them. And even though he was right about what he really should be doing, culturally, he was not allowed to be a rabbi until he was 30 years old. So from age 12 to age 30, Jesus goes to Nazareth and he works in a carpenter shop. Why? Because he was submissive to his parents, even though he had superior knowledge. Young people, your folks don't have to have a degree in uh, developmental psychology. In fact, you folks don't really have to have a clue. You just obey them in everything because it pleases the Lord. And it's not about are they smarter. It's not about do they understand you. It's not about do they get you. Your job as a child in this relationship is children obey your parents. Fathers, don't embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Dads, you know you're in charge but you can have power with people or power over people. And if you rule your home with too much harshness, you get an embittered child and embittered children backlash and rebound. Statistically proven that it happens. If you take the EPAC study that Stephen Glenn did and you've got a certain amount of, of love, autonomy, and control, and if it's balanced, you don't have any at-risk behavior taking place with your children, but if it's out of balance, you will. And then the last thing he says, he talks about slaves. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. Now listen to the attitude you have when you obey your earthly master. And do it not only when their eye is on you to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord And whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. He, he says, if, if you've got a job... And I guess everybody in here has one. You're not working for whoever it is you think you're working for. You're working for God. 
Young people, if Jesus was your math teacher and Jesus said do problems 25 through 35, what would you do and how would you do them? If Jesus was your biology teacher and said, I need a written report on this, this many pages, what would you do? If Jesus was your boss and said, I need you to come in early and I need you to stay late, how would you respond to that? He said, folks, when we interact with each other, we interact with each other as if we were interacting with Christ, not with just people. And that's what happens when you rise and you take off the old stuff and you put on the new stuff. And really, he goes ahead in chapter 4, verse 1, and says, Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know you have a master in heaven. If you're blessed to be an employer, if you're blessed to be in charge, if you're blessed to be somebody that other people work for you, you treat them right and fair because the way you treat the people who are under you is the way your master's going to treat you is what's inferred by this verse. Colossians 3, changing the way we live. Change the way we live, number one, involves change the way we see ourselves. I'm dead, I rose, I'm a different person. I take some things off, I put some things on. It changes the way I view you. I've got to see you as a person who's holy and loved and chosen by the Lord. And that changes the way we interact. It changes the way I talk about you. It changes the way I talk to you. It changes my response to you when you offend me. It changes my relationship with the Word of God because I've got a personal relationship to let it dwell in me richly. And then the example of relationship dynamics, wives to husbands, husbands to wives, children to parents, parents to children, slaves to masters, and masters to slaves. That's consistent Christian living. That's the character of the new person. If you're supposed to be a new person and you don't live this way, you're either a zombie or a puppet. Don't be a zombie. Don't be a puppet. Be that person that's a part of the new man that was raised from the dead. If you're here tonight and this is not the way you're living, we offer an invitation to say, change the way that you're living change the way you interact with God, thus change the way you interact with people. And if you have changes that you need to make, come tonight while we stand and while we sing. song in a moment number three we have the lord's supper prepared this evening if you'd like to partake of it we'll ask you to ease back to the foyer and you'll be shown where you can be served appreciate you visiting with us that's the case come back any other time you can let us know if we can serve you we'll sing the first and the second stanzas before we're dismissed in prayer
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, bless us this week with remembrances of the things that we've learned today. Help us to stay close to you. Father, we pray your blessings on those of this congregation who are needing your help in a special way. Bless them and help us to be a blessing to them as we can. Go with us, watch over us, keep us safe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.